Hello, everyone, and thank hey. you for joining us on another episode of our Lab to Lab series. Today's topic is Land a Whale, How to Get a DSO Business with Jay Collins. For those of you who are not familiar with the acronym DSO, it stands for Dental Service Organization, which basically means a large group of dentists and practices under one umbrella. Before we begin, I'm excited to introduce Jay Collins. Jay is a second generation lab owner and CEO of Cornerstone Dental Lab, located in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Thank you very much for joining us today, Jay. Uh, hey, Chris, thanks for having me, brother. Of course, man. Before we get into our topic, uh, I'd like to learn a little bit about your journey into dentistry and what your experience were like along the way. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my family's owned a dental lab since 1969. Um, I've been around it my whole entire life. Uh, I had a uncle get drafted, but didn't go over to Vietnam and came back a dental technician. And that kind of split our family in half. So half my family is union steam fitters out of Philadelphia and half my family are dental lab people. And, uh, you know, I was the first one, first male on either side of the family to go to college. I, I got to play college football in small division two school up in Pennsylvania and Williamsburg University. And uh, when I got done, I told people I didn't want to do pipes or I didn't want to do teeth, but I fell in love with my college sweetheart. We wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. and That's expensive, you know? So I'm pretty good at sales and marketing and growth. And uh, so we figured, you know, let me give it a shot selling teeth. And uh, that was roughly maybe about 15 years ago. And here we, have, here we are now, ever since. I bought the lab in 2012. I've been the manager practically running into day to day since basically 2009 so um and when i got it when i bought it from my uncle and his partner there was about eight to twelve of us doing about a million eight and now there's about 70 of us so we're roughly doing about a million a month wow amazing amazing have you always wanted to be in the dental industry well um i coming out of college my thing was uh i wanted to do either uh government contracts right uh banking or medical some kind of medical device and being a big lover of freedom and you know and being able to kind of have my own ways uh medical device this was the closest thing i could get the true medical device without having the fda breathing down my neck um you know and having different you know a lot of issues there's a lot more freedom in uh dental uh and we'll kind of get into that as we get into the dso stuff uh dso space because a lot of dso is outsourced to different parts of the world and you know fda requirements for that so that was the main choice of what picking back in the getting in the dental great um did you have any uh dental experience or are you trained as a technician at all absolutely not um so my dental experience uh was high school in the summer times working at my uncle's lab you know you know foreign models sweeping the floor basically trying not to get yelled at uh, and then that was basically it and then when i got back into it uh, you know, back in 08, I, it was just sales. I was outside sales. I was pounding the, pounding the phone, pounding the doors. I was trying, I tried to, a good day for me was seeing 20 new offices a day. Uh, my rec, my record was, I believe I almost uh, 43 stops, I believe was my record, you know, in one, one day from 8 AM to 8 PM. So it was, it was growth mode, you know, and that's, you know, never really wanted to do much with production, but once I bought it, our problem was we, our, we built a sales engine that was successful uh, with all avenues and we had to produce it. And, you know, so I kind of got pulled into production organically, you know, to help with that because our thought process usually is dental lab people. As I, that's what I do classify myself as a dental lab person is, you know, we want to try to get to a certain point where we have enough work and, you know, the only thing scarier when you don't have, you know, when you have too much work is when you don't have enough work. So it's that, that constant struggle of, you know, which, you know, how, how, what's the next case coming in and how do I make it? I completely understand that. Definitely. Um, what is your business background like? So, um, you know, it's interesting. People ask me that. Um, I went to Bloomsburg University. I have a business management degree. I spent a lot of time in marketing at, at Bloom. Uh, great school. Uh, I learned amazing things in Excel. Uh, but outside of that, uh, Everything was learned here in the lab. You know, uh, it, I, I argue with my, my friends. I'm, I'm almost 40 now, 36. 
it's 37 years old and you know the same you know my peers that are in business in all different industries i'm like i'm in an industry man that doesn't really supply you know doesn't really follow supply and demand and then they're like what and i'm like well think about it the demand for the product goes up every year yeah uh the people the need for the product goes up every year the supply chain is shrinking for the product i mean with COVID, we i think i saw one place said that we lost six thousand labs forever you know i don't you know even if that's only three thousand labs we keep shrinking but the price of the product doesn't go up <laughs> you know um I, my my uncle who was making a non-precious crown for 58 bucks you know we got people paying some of our dsos paying less than that now you know so it's a it's a very interesting industry you know so so learning the business side of it's been pretty much at the bench, if you would say. Wow, that's that's crazy. Do you have your own marketing team, or do you do most of the things yourself? All over the place. So yeah. uh, we do. We have uh, April, who is our customer service manager, fulfillment manager. She is a graphic arts uh, train, uh, you know, classically trained as a graphics art person uh, out of Savannah, Georgia, and beautiful school and awesome. And she kind of took a job as an office manager in the lab. Around the same time I came back, it's just a temporary job until she found her dream job, and she's been here pouring her heart and soul into this business with me ever since. So she kind of runs point on our web stuff and our social media stuff. Uh, we've used outside firms, we've used third-party firms that specialize in like American Smiles. Uh, we have cold calling inside, we have cold calling outside. We have tried it all at least three times. Um, and what I've learned over the last you know 12, 15 years definitely is. It all works. We can argue how successful it works and mm -hmm. what works best or best practice, but you have to be consistent in your message and you have to put out consistent effort. Definitely, definitely. Well, tell me a little bit more about your lab, kind of, you know, how it started. And then I think you have a couple labs under your umbrella now, correct? Yeah, so I, I, I found a strong niche in, uh, you know, doing lab acquisitions uh, for guys that are under 3 million, you know, or, you know, you know, National Dentex, DSG before they joined National Dentex, like so these bigger groups really want that lab for a standalone to be about five million. And, you know, and there's a lot of labs out there that, that you know, the owners are in their 60s, pushing their 70s, and they don't have an exit strategy, never had an exit strategy, and they're kind of stuck. Uh, they don't have enough, you know, or the price that they're going to willing to, you know, to take isn't enough from the big groups, so they kind of have to pull together. So I've actually bought, I believe, 12 labs total in my career. Oh. Uh, to roll up to create this base that we have now. Um, they've all been local. They've all been uh, rolled up within the hour driving distance. Um, I probably think this thing doesn't end probably without me having a second location. You know, a standalone second location. I've looked twice at just the deal that's come together. Uh, but it's been a blessing because it's it's brought us not just clients, and, you know, accounts, but it's brought us equipment, you know, uh, somewhat, but talent, people. Uh, you know, because it's a cool thing about us dental people is, for the most part, we're loyal as hell, man. You know, I, I have I have people working for me that, you know, I, I bought their, their lab they were working at, and they're like, I would have never came to work for you in a million years, and you are so much better person to work for, and so much better environment, but until you, and since you didn't own us at that point, I wasn't going to work for you. You know, I, there's a joke, there's two technicians in the lab that um, I've always wanted to have in my lab, so I bought their labs so they could work for me. It's a joke, you know what I mean? So, um, but they would have never came on board, but they say it's a, the best thing that's ever happened. To them. Wow, that, that's amazing. Um, do you run your labs as like individual kind of entities, or do you kind of specialize one lab for something else, or how do you, how do you so work? So, we currently run them in the uh, like production lines, right? So, um, the, the umbrella is called the, the dental lab net, right? We wanted something very simple, very easy to understand, and you know. When you walk in and say, I'm here from the lab, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Uh, the the main uh, branch under there is Cornerstone. That's you know kind of what we operate as. Cornerstone in you know is uh, a strong you know uh, production lab facility. We have another line that's called Amsterdam. Uh, it's got a great story. Uh, Dr. Amsterdam basically created the Ferio Cross program. That whole concept out of UPenn. He had his own lab uh, 40 plus years. Uh, we bought that lab for our full mouth knowledge, you know, with Al Nelson, you know. Uh, then we have a great uh, high-end line called Broadway that has 40 plus years of experience uh, where we do a lot of PFMs, a lot of wax and cast. Uh, and we're still pushing close to 25 
you know, 30 PFM units a day some days at full price, you know, so that market's still out there. And so one of the cool things is being exposed to all these different labs and all these different lab owners who work here now, I have a great resource. I have four or five guys that used to run their own shop for 30 plus years that I can go to when I have problems and say, how, how did you guys handle this? How did you guys understand this? And we kind of can put our heads together and they always can say the same thing. Well, when I was running my lab, so my running joke is, well, I was the owner here, you know, we would, you know, so because uh, we're all strong willed individuals, as you can imagine. No, I can definitely imagine that. Uh, we're going to run our first poll right now. Um, do you guys currently work with a DSO? Yes, we're a trusted partner with DSOs. Yes, it's off and on. Or no, they're a tough nut to crack. So Jay, what? Are you, I'm assuming you're a full service lab, of course, right? Yes, sir. So we are full service, both domestically and internationally. Uh, we have capabilities in Vietnam and China. Uh, we okay. uh, also have an ortho uh, line that we utilize pretty, pretty consistently. Um, and what we have had, what we found out is you kind of have to, if you're going to service the current market, especially mm -hmm. the DSO space, the way I think I have found success is you can't be single track minded on how you want to produce, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, um, and a lot of lab guys that I talk to think like that, like, Oh, I got, I got an opportunity with this mid market DSO. They have 20 offices. They want a PFM for $37. I can't make that. I can't do that. I don't, I can't do their work, but they would pay you 310 bucks for your implants, you know? And, and what, you know, and that's something that you could make for it. So like what we found is we had, we had to use outsourcing and insourcing, you know, not necessarily just send it overseas to China and Vietnam, but uh, using Argon to fill in gaps in our games, using Alana to fill in gaps in our game, you know, uh, uh, design services like we use you guys to fill in gaps in our game. So with all that kind of stuff, you know, it's been very difficult, you know, to balance all that. You know what I mean? No, I, I understand exactly what you mean. I mean, there's no way you can do everything on your own. And plus, if you get overflow or things happen, people get sick. It's amazing to have that team that can assist you when you need them. And, put them into your workflow. and that's that is a lot of lab guys, you know, lab gentlemen, lab women, you know, lab people have a heart. You know, when I talk to lab people, let me, you know, let me rework this. And they say, no, I don't do work with DSOs. I kind of say, man, you've got to figure out how to do work with DSOs. Number one, because that's the work, right? Number two, um, so you have to understand that that's going to be a continual growing market as Wall Street and private equity keeps dumping more money into it. So um, we have been very blessed. We have about 60% of our revenue comes to DSO. We've built some strong relationships. One of the best things about the DSO market that I have seen, um, I've only had one not try to pay me. For the most part, it is pretty honest and straightforward so, uh, accounts receivable terms, accounts payable terms, it. because they're a business, you know, they're trying to run, you know, a business mm -hmm. and they, on the counter spot, they rely on you to give you proper products, you know? I would. No, that's a really good point. You know, that uh, constant uh, cash flow is, is very important and for an established business, you can see it has to be profitable cash flow though. It has to be profitable yeah. cash flow. A lot of us lab people love to do you know more work at, at a loss. You know, I'll fix it with volume. It's like, well, we're not making money. Well, give me more of it. <laughs> that's that's yeah. funny. Yeah. No, I completely see that. Um, what kind of equipment do you use? That's uh, that's another good question. I am partial to VHF on the milling side. Um, okay. I've had Rollins. I have AG currently now. Um, uh, I don't have you know uh, an exact reason why um, I can't make Roland work or AG work in my lab. Uh, VHF has stood by me and, you know, has helped me dramatically. It's also, they're less than a two hour ride for me. So I've been able to go there and get support directly from them. Um, uh, the Rollins, uh, uh, Ian O'Neill at Roland has been a phenomenal resource when he was with Cap, then he came, you know, went to Roland. Uh, I don't think this thing ends without me getting a Roland mill. You know, he's really good at that. He's making sure that, you know, every lab gets what they need. Uh, AG's been excellent. I got my two AG mills from uh, one of my acquisitions. So I had no, you know, no previous experience with them. Uh, but their support with Mo and, you know, the team there has been very helpful. But for the most part, the lion's share of our milling is on uh, our VHF mills. On the printer side, my wife will tell you, I've never saw a 3D printer that I don't like. Um, I have form labs. I have a 
Carbon, I have Sega, I have Cara, uh, I've had uh, Ego, I've had um, you know some of the hobby printers. Uh, I, I got an R-Pod when Justin Marks was selling them directly to labs before he changed his business model. So uh, if it's 3D printed, we're going to try it, and then we're going to try it and try it again you know, uh, because of the workflows that 3D printing allows. Nice. Um, with your mills, are you doing both wet and dry, or is it... Absolutely. Yep. So we're uh, we're doing a lot of lithium silicate, a lot of Emax with the wet. Uh, okay. uh, but you know, PMA. We're trying. We're experimenting more and more with Trusana, at you know, from Meyerson through Henry Shine on printing the PMMAs, like full mouth stuff. Uh, you know, because we do do a bit of full mouth reconstruction work. And then, uh, but we're milling a, a bulge of our a bulk of our zirconia with the, the VHF. Uh, we do a lot of wet milling with the VHF as well. Wet milling for zirconia as well, or wet milling? No. Like the, the uh, for a lithium cell kit, uh, we're we're experimenting. Uh, we have, you know, we do desk blanks, nantica blanks, uh, you know, anti trading blanks uh, for our cost effective backs. We're experimenting with milling chrome cobalt. Uh, we, nice. you know, we're gonna get get it through AG. We're getting into Cintron. You know, uh, I am a big fan of full mouths done in chrome cobalt and building yeah. cells back and forth onto it. And zirconia, I, I'm not a fan of zirconia. And zirconia has its place. I just don't like it full mouth, but it's easier to make because it's you need less talented finishers to do the full, mouth, full zirconia. Definitely. No, I agree with you. I think the flexibility of having metal for strength and flexibility is huge versus zirconia. But like you said, everything has its own you know a place in the industry, and uh, zirconia is a great great option to have. Um, you were also saying that you were using your printers, right? You had a long list of printers. Are you using some more for other things like uh, models or maybe digital dentures? Or you have a carbon. I mean, carbon's kind of up there as one of the top things. Is that like your production horse, or how, how so, are you doing that? Yeah. So we we divide our workflow uh, by print, right? So um, our carbon has only ever bulk printed dentures, and that's what we use. So. The loser tone print, my friend, is that um, We roughly probably do 25 to 30 digital dentures a day, um, and that's because of a DSO and a workflow that we built mm -hmm. for DSO, right? So, um, and we'll get into this more when we talk about the DSOs yeah. and production. Uh, our form labs we predominantly print is uh, our models and you know some night guard stuff and surgical guide stuff. Our seekers are new to us. We just got them at the year end. So we started with just models, but we're starting to you know experiment more with printing night guards uh, and different product offering we got to them. And then the Cara is like our down and right dirty, you know, Cara is colder printer for speed. Uh, prints all our soft tissue and then we do rush cases with it, uh, you know, stuff that has to go, 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 you know, so it works really well for that. Perfect. That's a great division. We have a lot of questions regarding DSOs, but I kind of want to get into the topic before I answer some of these questions. Um, but before we begin, I got one more question for you. What are your future plans for Cornerstone? Um, you know, we're we're aggressive in our growth. You know, we want to spin, continue growing. This kind of gets into that DSO talk. I, I was trained, and I believe that there is basically only one or two ways a business is going: it's either growing or dying. And yeah. you know, and that's and it's hard for a lot of you know business owners, lab owners to hear that, but it's true. You know, it's either you're growing your business or your your business is dying. And with Very that true. being said, you have to figure that out. And I am constantly going to be in a growth mode as long as I'm in this chair, right? And you know, and that's part of my personality. I mean, literally, I sit in the middle of the production floor. I do not. There's you know, we have a eight thousand square foot facility. We have sixteen thousand square feet total in our building, and we don't. I don't have an office. You know, I'm right here in the thick of things with customer service. I sit with them, you know, you know, CAD cams behind me, millings behind me, printing to the left of me, dentures is right, you know, working. I can smell the monomer every day on my packet. You know what I mean? So, uh, and uh, being very intimately involved at this level with my production team and my sales team and my customer service team and my finance team, I have to grow them, you know? So uh, we're, we're, we're going to look at some more acquisitions, I'm sure, over time. Uh, we have a really good growth model. We, we brought in 110 new docs in the first quarter of this wow. year. Uh, that is our new record. You know, so Dave Grove, who runs our sales team, you know, he, you know, he set a goal out there to break 100. You know, it was a lofty goal, and he did it. Uh, and it wasn't just signing up one break, you know, DSO where we got 80 new docs. You know, it yeah, was, you know, that was, was good. my question. 
yeah, it was good, consistent growth, right? So, um, uh, but like every lab, we struggle with retention um, because the unfortunate thing, and back to our business conversation when I talk to my peers, they don't, people don't understand, most people outside our industry, we make a custom made product, usually at a fixed price, but the hardest part, at a fixed timeline. You know, like I, I've literally called docs the night before that I have personal relationships with and said, hey, man, uh, I want another two days of this case. This isn't right. And they're like, I understand it. And then that case never comes back. And I'm like, wow. But then I put my whole heart and soul in something with my team and we send it. We get told it's the biggest piece of crap they've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's that, such a weird industry when it comes that's to that. That's so true. Sometimes getting things done uh, without that quality is more important than, you know, getting that timeline in. So. And that's and that's hard to hear, right? Because we're craftsmen, yeah. right? So like, and you know, would you put it in your mouth? Would you put it in your mom's mouth? And then you know, and then as you go down this road with DSOs, they you know they have a schedule to keep. They have a they have a profit margin to make. They have a quarterly report they have to hit. So it's like you have to make these these compromises with yourself along the way. It's it's tough. And some and some lab guys don't want to do it, and that's fine. If you don't want to do it, um, but it's going to be hard for us to continue to grow with. You know, out having some form of interjection of the SR work. No, I completely understand that. Well, uh, let's let's kind of move into that topic. You know, on how to attract DSOs. So getting okay. started, um, where and how do you get it a secure like your first DSO account? What do you what do you look for? All right. So the very first thing I think, uh, you know, you look down to your register, your roster, your register, your docs, right, and you see who is transitioning or who has recently transitioned right? because unfortunately the way this this game works nowadays the students coming out of the, these you know, dental schools are so straddled with debt already that it's very very rare that they come out debt free number one number two is that they go out and work into what used to be the stable go find an associateship work at a small yeah. office, you know, for five years and then buy it off for the doctor. Right. Yeah. Right. So a lot of these guys and girls come out of dental school and they're going to have to go work for one of these groups, you know, because they need instant injective revenue because they have a mortgage payment to make that is their student loan payments, right? You know, so I, I talked to some of my docs and they're telling me they're having 600000 in debt. They can't even go buy a house yet. You know what I mean? And so, and it comes back to numbers, right? You have to look at the numbers. You have to run your business by the numbers. So Glidewell put out a lot of great information. It's older now. It's almost 10 years old. But he kind of put out the marketing figures, you know, showing us that the average dental practice, you know, this was probably about 2012, was doing about a million two a year. Of that million two, the, the restorative the owner could take 300000 in income, which, if you really think about it, for that amount that liability is like, it isn't a lot of money. Yeah, you know what I mean. You know, now yeah, they might only have to work a couple of days a week, but if you're if you have a three hundred thousand income and you are paying, you know, twenty five hundred dollars a month, you know, in student loan payments or more, if you're paying thirty to forty thousand dollars a year in student loan payments, it gets eaten up rather quickly. You know, so um, so if we know that the average dental office is doing, let's just call it a million five, and the average dentist is taking away three hundred thousand. We should know other things. Well, what's their average lab spend? And I will put out there that it was about six to eight percent. You know, so just keep the numbers simple. It's about six to eight thousand dollars a year if you want to use a million dollars in revenue. Um, well, Cornerstone average doctor only spent a thousand bucks with them. So where, where's the other five thousand six thousand dollars? Well, you know, you got to get into it with your client. So as you look down your client register and you see who's billing the most and who's billing the least. You look at that top doc that, you know, or just top three docs and say to yourself, well, when, if they leave or when they go, what happens to me? You know, so you have to be part of their exit track. That's what I found out with the DSS. And I, I, I had a great doc that, look, you know, did locally and he, and he built a nice little practice, six offices, four, you know, four docs. They rotated to the one office and then he sold the whole thing uh, to uh, DCA, Dental Care Alliance, uh, who was our first true DSO. And, you know, and through that, you know, his negotiations, I was very close to him saying, hey, man, you know, just introduce me to whoever I have to talk to. Let me know whatever I have to do. And we've been doing these days work, you know, off and on in their different regions since, since that beginning. So the very first thing is what a lab owner has to do if the lab owner is going to be the person who's going to pursue it. Um, if you find your strengths as a lab owner is in production, 
and not in sales and marketing, but you have a healthy fear of failure, you need to find somebody that's going to do this. Because this is a department, the sales department, the marketing department is a department just like Crown and Bridge, just like removal, just like Mono. Has to be it has to be held to standards, it has to hit their numbers, and it has to be ran like a actual dental department, right? So if you recognize that in your skill set, you don't want that or have that, then you have to remove yourself from that and outsource that to somebody in your organization that can do that. And if they don't if you don't have that person, you need to find that person immediately, right? Because DSO sales for me have been two parts, right? Number one, getting on the formulary, getting to the head honchos, getting to the board, getting to the chief technical officer, or the chief clinical officer, or how, and getting past the trial, right? Um, you know, and what a lot of guys and gals on the lab side are very fearful. Well, I don't want to bring on this DSO work or not, you know, or deal with this because they're going to swap me with work. Eh, eh, never happens. Uh, at least in my experience. Gotcha. You get past the trial, now you have the second part of the sales engine. Now you have to go and introduce yourself and sell yourself to every single office in their organization. Never have I experienced in the 15 or so DSOs that we do business with, has it been like, okay, Cornerstone's in, Jay's team is great, send them all your work. It's, I have literally, I have a group that uh, 90 offices here in the Philadelphia area where we're going door to door, you know, over the next year to introduce yourself. We have people who don't even know that we're are allowed to be, uh, you know, their lab, and we've been with them for over eight months, you know, and it's like, we've presented at your company meetings, you know, we, we've we been on your board calls, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I didn't know that, I didn't pay attention, you know, so it's, that's why it's a two-part sale, you know, because a lot of guys and gals get the part one done, and then they sit on their, on, on their butt, they're like, all right, let, let, let the cases roll in, it's like, no, 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 just like you had to build a relationship with that mom and pop right down the street to trust and love you, it's the same thing with these this big group. Now you have to go into the individual offices and build that same relationship. Does that make sense here? Oh, no, it completely makes sense. Um, I'm going to answer some of these questions that we got, or I'm going to you yeah. know read them out to you. Um, you kind of touch bases on some of these, but at what point of your business do you decide it's time to get a DSO account and why? You Are you always kind of getting them, or at one point are you stopping? Are you afraid of kind of scaling up and not having the resource to complete them? How do you kind of tackle that? It's a great question. So um, my my sense of urgency and what I'm building my, my business around is the thought process that we have zero contracts, right? Um, you know, you might have some groups that want to sign a contract on price or something like that, but they there isn't a DSO that I found yet that guarantees the amount of work, right? Because if you think about it logically, they can't. They can't go into the operatory and tell the, tell the dentist what labs to use. They can incentivize, they can build a reimbursement structure that helps the doctor financially better to use one lab over another, but at the end of the day, that's between the doctor and the patient, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll never sign a, a, a guarantee, at least not that I've seen yet. Um, so what I've found as our, in our Philadelphia major market area that we, you know, you know, service, you know, a chunk of our business, about 40% of our business. As more and more DSOs kept popping up, or groups, whatever you want to call them, uh, I said, we have to get into this. We have to figure out how to make this work. So that was our sense of urgency. And knowing that the average doctor life cycle with us is about 30 months, you know, we, I have doctors who've been doing business in my, with my family for, you know, 30 plus years. Yeah. You know, I, I, I have personal doctors that I've cold called on and built a relationship with me and have been with me from the beginning. But I have had guys and gals leave me. I have, I had one group leave me, you know, $9,000 a month in revenue because the other lab had, uh, the other lab's driver was cuter than my driver. <laughs> you know, I mean, literally, the doctor told me that face straight to my face and didn't laugh. He's like, wow. "Yeah, I'm tired of. I don't want to hear the girls in the office complain about how ugly your UPS driver is. So we're gonna go back to the old lab because he's cute." And I said, "Okay, you know, nine thousand dollar a month business decision made on that. Okay, that's fine. You know, after he complimented how great our work was. So knowing that there is no contract that locks us in, knowing that there is no uh, exact, you know, mechanism, there is gonna be turnover." And that's hard. That's hurtful, man. You know, especially if you make the work and you're prideful in the work, yeah. and then you have sales and marketing people who are compensated on residuals on that. So it's hard to come up with that reality. You're going to lose this account, but nothing lasts forever. No, that that definitely makes sense. 
a uh, couple more questions here. Have you ever tried a uh, call uh, cold calling DSOs? Or, well, where do you go to find some of these places? So yeah, I've yes, absolutely. You, the thing in sales that I've learned is you have to have a plan, right? You know, uh, Vince Lombardi taught us, right? You're either mm -hmm. you know either part of the steamroller or part of the pavement. Pick one. You know what I mean, right? So uh, we do a tool. We use a tool in our sales department called Cookbook. Right, where we require a certain amount of calls, touches across the board, and we build buckets. And my information's out there, my cell phone's out there, my web, you know, my emails out there. Call me, email me. I'll explain it in more detail and intimate level how that works. But in that cookbook, like, so I have a cookbook that I follow, right? That um, no one requires me to turn it in. No one checks on my cookbook, right? Because I'm the owner. Yep. I have to touch base with new DSOs a certain amount. I try to touch base with one new dso a quarter and have them somewhere in my pipeline of close you know because i'm usually responsible for the first the first sale getting us into a dso negotiating a rate that makes sense for both us and them and then going to work, right mm -hmm. and one of the things is um we have been trying you know to be consistent with is in that cold calling to be consistent in the message right i have a group that you know, i asked them if i could tell them they said well, they want to remain nameless because i basically hounded them professionally right you're gonna be you're gonna be persistent and obtain in the ends you're gonna be confident and cocky you got to line into that cross yeah. so you're always confident and always persistent you never want to cross those lines and I will literally call this gentleman every third Thursday of the month at 7 a.m. a light clockwork I would put this I would put it in my phone I would pop up I would call him and I would text him. I would reach out to him. Every it took over a year until he finally answered me. We had a great initial call. Everything went great. And he said, "Listen, you know, give me about three Thursdays from now. Give me a call." Yeah. And he and I never spoke to him again for a year. But every third Thursday, I would just call him again. And so that was every time. Which is, hey man, how you doing? If there's any chance, let me know. Hey, and I, I would try to make it relevant to him because he was where he was from. You know, of you know, like losing his. Like I was just trying anything to have him start a conversation with me. And then you know, uh, what what happened was just recently their big lab that they were using, and we won't name names, got shut down in China. All and, China. They, and I texted him, and it was just our normal Thursday text. And my normal Thursday text to him, and he never answered. And he right back. He's like, dude, you manufacture in China? I'm like, I do China, Vietnam, and the United States. Just give me pricing for domestic-based manufacturing right now. I said, okay, man, we'll slow down. Okay, I get it. You're in yeah. Yeah, Let's figure this out. You know, so you have to be consistent with your cold calling message. No, that, that's a very good point. There's a fine line from calling too much and then not calling enough. So I think that's a good strategy you have to keep it consistent so, and just wait for timing to kind of play it out. So we call that an upfront contract in our world, right? We, we, we spent a lot of money and time in, uh, in a sales system, just like you would invest in PTC or invest in, you know, uh, I have to come out or any training protocol. We invested in a sales training protocol it's called the Sandler Selling System. We loved it. It worked for us. Uh, you know, we use it all the time, right? And one of the, in that process, they taught us an upfront contract. So I explained to my prospects, was like, hey, listen, at any time you can stop the ride. Yeah. You know, but if you don't stop the ride, I'm going to keep going. And my job is to keep going. You know, so what was the name of that system again, Jay, that you were talking about? Sa Sandler Selling System. Okay. Sandler. He's a guy based out of Boston, uh, Baltimore. You know, he's, he is, he's passed away now. Um, there's franchises all over the world. It's a great, great company to get involved with. Um, you know, they will teach you the basics of sales all the way up to, you know, refining you. And, um, and depending on what franchise, they'll even help you build a sales engine. Great. Uh, a couple more questions here as well. Do you feel the DSO accounts is the best way to scale your lab, or do you kind of aim for something else? Um, it's both, and I know that's a that's like a wimpy way to answer that. Um, no, I agree. We love we we love DSO work. Um, we know it's tight margin. We know it's not great margin. Um, would I would I would I turn all my accounts into mom and pop thousand dollar a month? Single unit A2, uh, number you know number 12. Yeah, Why not? absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I, you know, but it's not the reality of the situation, right? You know, um, yeah. So uh, you got to look at your business model, right? You got to look at what you're building, what you're trying to do. Uh, if you just, you know, if you need growth, right? 
once again, we talked about it. You're either growing or dying. Yeah. DSO is a great way to grow and to be sticky. You know, uh, and and that's how we've gotten into a couple of our other DSOs were referrals from our existing dealer. Because you, let's say the average dental lab is doing about a half million a year, 600,000 a year, right? So that's about 45 doctors billing on an annual basis, of which 25 bill every month, right? Of those 25, do you think they know any other doctors? Of course. Right. They yeah, probably know three to six. Mm-hmm. Why haven't those other 25 given you the names of three other doctors to get you to you know, over 100 doctors? Because these people, these doctors, sometimes have this this concept where if I give you too many referrals, then you're not going to spend as much time on their work. Got you. Exactly. Or not be available for them. Uh, you know, uh, we get that complaint here. Oh, when I started with Jay, because I do a lot of the full mouth implant setup, that's what yeah. I was trained to do on. Uh, when I deal with Jay, everything's great. When I don't get Jay, it's, you know, it sucks. I'm like, well, no, Jay doesn't do any of the work. He has the conversation. He knows how to plan the case. He got trained in it. And Jay's handing it off to the same people. Jay just wasn't available to plan the case. The case is still going through the same pipeline. Yeah. You know what I mean? So DSOs are different. I I have found they are willing to give referrals. Okay. They understand, you know, that you need to grow too. And they and if, they're, if they view you as a partner in their business, they, they want you to stick around. Because for true. them, just as hard as it is to get into DSOs and get it to work, a new it's lab. hard. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's a pain in the butt for them. Retraining all their docs and all that and, you know, having, you know, those relationships. What what lab are we using this week? Who's, exactly. who's the main contact? So, yeah. So, so I would think uh, that is. Yeah. A lot of moving parts, you know, to switch to a new lab. Yep. Um, I kind of have like a two part question for you. Uh, what systems you have in place to help streamline your uh, workflows and then kind of, you know, what, uh, how do you choose, you know, the right outsourcing partners? Okay. So, um, all right, we'll take the first one, you know, as it comes. So, uh, we have done a lot of, uh, six Sigma, uh, with, uh, a gentleman named, uh, Bob or Robert Yankner. Uh, out of Connecticut. Uh, his big brother, Chuck Yankner, you know, worked at Densify. He's been in our industry for 100 years. He does, you know, lab acquisitions and sales. He's trying to retire. I keep keeping him from retiring. Um, so it's what a lot of lab guys and gals have to realize is you're running a production business and it needs to be ran as such. Not as maybe an assembly line. We're not making a standard form, pull the press out from the widget. But it's getting to that point, it's getting damn near close to that because of the technology and the software and the materials. So you have to start thinking like that. And that's not a skill set that I naturally have. So I immediately want to bring someone in that has that skill set. Um, we are currently uh, you know, working with David Avery, uh, you know, uh, who uh, worked with uh, Drake for all those years. He's helping us with SOPs. You know, this is, you have to be working on your business because we spoke about it briefly. The reality of it is my belief that most doctors at this point where they are with the pressure that they're under, they will take a B product on time rather than a lay pro- a, 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 an A product late. Um, that, that seems to be the reality in general. Do we have 10% of docs that want the case right no matter what and they don't, they don't schedule their patient? Of course we do. Of course. You know, yeah, you know, but the other ninety percent, they they their doctor is lucky. They're seeing my crown before the patient needs them there. You know, their first time the doctor usually seeing the crown is when the you know the team is handing it to him for him to put it in the mouth. You know, and it never is on the model, and the doctor doesn't even know what he's he or she's getting. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so with that being said, you have to build a consistent production line, so that if you have problems, you can go quickly and figure out and troubleshoot where it is. Um, on, what helps you on with that production the, line? Do you have like a line <laughs> software or do you have like a, a special team in place that kind of focuses? Yeah, on so, yeah, so uh, we are, uh, we uh, we have our lab management software that uh, we created our recipes and, uh, you know, and our production line. But anything dealing with software technology is just a dummy box, right? It's only as smart as the dummy who's operating it. You yeah. Know? So like you, you can have the best systems in the world you know, set up, but if you're not working inside the systems and using them, that's, that's where you have to build your team. You know, so we do have uh, a pretty big button here with our production manager, and then 
our crown and bridge manager. Uh, we're currently, you know, interviewing for a new removal manager. Uh, we have we have a weekly production meeting, and then they usually have daily huddles from there, breaking out, kind of explain it to the lab, you know, and quantity, what's going on, and what opportunities. Because um, I do uh, a you know four hundred one k here with a profit sharing match, you know, so that part of it. It, it directly affects their, their paycheck. And my guys and girls notice when a doctor goes away. You know, hey, we haven't seen Dr. Smith in a while. What's going on, Jay? All right, let me talk to Dave up in sales, figure out what's going on. Oh, are we going to get any more of this work? Uh, you know, this group seems to be really liking it and uh, they're ramping up, you know. But also, you have to, on the production side, which I spend a lot of time planning, you have to understand how much work you're going to get so you can keep that consistent. So it's a balance. It is definitely a balance. Oh, that's great. Um, I got this question here. It's kind of, uh, I would say, maybe on a lab owner side of it. It's, uh, are you being paid every 30 days? And is that is that something that's kind of uh, the uh, main reason to, like, would you get rid of a dentist if they didn't pay you within the first 30 days? Or does it depend on how big they are? What, how do you treat that? Right, so accounts pay, or accounts receive. It's a pain yeah. in the butt, right? You know, uh, I have all gamuts. I'm not a perfect operator. I have talked to lab guys who said, if I don't get paid on the first, on the 30th day, I cut them off. That's not me. Um, you know, I wish it was, you know, maybe as we continue to get bigger, we can. I have, um, I recently had to send a case to Rowe Dental Lab. Um, I know the guy, I know BJ, I've talked to him a couple of times. I know the guy Sam who runs the full mouth division. I don't know them, per, you know, like we're not best friends, you know, we're separated by 500 miles, but they, I had a Sweden Martina case. I couldn't melt myself. I sent it to them. They literally wouldn't talk to me about my case until I paid for it, you know? So like, so I've seen all walks of life as, you know, where it comes to accounts receivable. Our DSOs, that is a very, very important conversation we have um, at the very beginning of starting a relationship. If the DSO needs terms over 60 days, I can't go as cheap on the product as they would like. Yeah. So I use that as leverage. You know, hey, like, I really need this product at, you know, X amount of dollars, and I got to pay you on the 61st day. It's like, you can't have both, but... You, you know, I can be your bank or I could be your, 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 your cost effective production facility. I can't be both. It's very hard. I, you know, I have to pay. So a lot of my DSOs, believe it or not, pay us every Friday, you know, as, and, and as what I have seen, if they have grown and gotten bigger, they've come, they've been more consistent with the payment. Uh, you know, yeah, you know, that's impressive. Yeah. Cause you know, cause they're getting, um, what they're getting together with, you know, more business people. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, they're, you know, they understand cash flow is king, you know, so um, I still have some mom and pop docs that I literally have to text for Helena who does our accounts receivable, like that I have a personal relationship with, like, yo, bud, you got to get Helena a check or she's going to cut you off. But our rule in the lab is 61 days. At the moment your account is on the 61st day, by one okay. penny, we shut it down. Nice. It's on COD. Um, I, and I had a doctor owed me a bit of change, you know, for his two off or four offices. He owed me in the eight thousand dollar range, and I shut it down at the sixty first day. And I got a phone call, you know, basically from their attorney saying, if I don't ship it immediately, these are medical devices. This is, you know, I'm gonna, you know, go to prison. Like, you know, just a a, <laughs> a, vague, a vague attorney threat, you know. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, that's cool. Well, I can read too. I can I can research too. So I sent it all out of the lab. It went to the office's front door, but it went with a COD of eight thousand dollars from UPS, wow. and they didn't. And, and UPS brought me the case of that. When we went to court, the judge looked right at me, and I explained the, my side of the story. The judge said, "Turned to the office, said, well, he tried to get paid. Why didn't you pay him? You know, because you can't walk into CVS and say, give me that Z pack of antibiotics, and I'm not paying you. You have to. I have a prescription here. He's like, you know, how come the why does the dentist think they could do that to a lab guy? Yeah, we no. let him. You know, so yeah, no, the account receivables is huge. Uh, I know uh, our lab ma lab management software has that uh, automated in there, so it kind of sends it out every week yeah, or every month, whenever you set it up. Yeah, you have to you have to stay on top of that. Fantastic. So, what would you say is your three biggest um, kind of techniques to acquiring the DSOs? What do you kind of use? Well, the first thing I, the first thing I do is I. Kind of take a survey of my my production my resources and say to myself what do i want to grow uh, what am i best at right mm -hmm. so uh you know a staple for us is 
flexi partials, finishes, uh, a, and implants, screw chain implants. We love it from Cobalt Technique, yep. right? And then uh, we, uh, we're pretty good at servicing doctors that want outsourced business models, right? That's our three you know, things that we're best at. Uh, we do a lot of zirconia, you know, we do a lot of acrylic work, we do a lot of all on the boards and all, you know, not, not that we're bad at them, but they, these are the three things that we really excel at, right? So with that being said, we were trying to leverage that in the DSOs. So like to give you an example, like I might price a deal out with a DSO that wants a $150 flexible partial, right? Uh, well, that, that's tight margins. We're really trying to get 295 for a flexible partial, you know, okay. soup to nuts, you know, we're very yeah. drinking fully loaded, right? So how are we going to do that? Well, I know I want to get my flexi partial finishes in that 120 or 150 range. Well, they're only willing to pay one thing, right? Mm. So, so I might front load it and do the setup really, really cost effective for them, but I'll send that to our lab in Vietnam and have them set it. And I tell them my work. Okay. I build it. For them. I don't hide anything, you know. I tell them, and if they say, "Well, I don't want it going out," and it's like, "Well, then you got to raise the price. I can't do it for 150." You know, I mean, I, I don't want it to go out, and I don't. I didn't get in this business to build international workflows and international production. I got in business to build this production. You know, that's what I want to do. I, I, you know, we have 70 people here now. I, you know, I want a company full of 200 people someday. You know, um, I love people. That's why I do this all the time. Right? So. So you have to kind of figure that out and leverage that, you know, um, you might have a really good niche in a group, you know, doing their all on fours and offering share side support. And they're like, hell, let me throw you some zirconia. Let me throw you some zirconia. You're like, well, I don't want to tie up my mills for that. So you might want to send that to Argon or overseas, you know, yeah. um, like, you know, because, you know, your mills are busy or you don't want to get into more capital investment at this point. You know, so you have to leverage what you want to do, number one, because this whole thing is about what you want to do, you know. You got to go to work every day. That's what I explain to my people: the difference between a job and a career. A job stands for just over broke, you know, J O B. A career is something you have a passion for. And not everyone in my building has a passion for this, but yeah. you know, we're gonna love and respect each other and work on that. You, you get what I'm saying? So. No, I completely um, understand. So that's probably the first thing: is trying to understand what you want to do, mm -hmm. um, and what kind of work you want to do, and what you excel at, right? Um, because you don't want to get into things that you're not strong at, you know, because especially early on, it's going to be you with the team doing a lot of that. Um, That's great advice. So, you know, so um, we got into printing dentures, you know, pretty early, you know, back when Denko was the only game in town and we were doing the heck out of that. This was like 70 years ago. So I've always had a passion for printing dentures. So I went out and found a DSO that we could build a workflow that works. You know, so what we found is we found a DSO that services, uh, you know, retirement homes. Right. And then, you know, and they're like, like, listen, hey, man, this is the deal. We have a doctor that goes to the home, and in their bag is a dental office. It has a stock upper, a stock lower, and putty. And we're going to make a mush pipe. Well, we get literally one impression, and we have to send them back and finish denture. It is a tough gig, but we make great money with them, and they make great money. And it's and it's a and you can only do that digital, right? You know. So we we developed a whole workflow for them and us that it now employs four people in the denture department. That without that without that group we wouldn't have that work and now we we're meeting with a new dso tomorrow that's coming for a tour of the lab to show that whole workflow to to show hey we can do it for you too you know very impressive nice what kind of mistakes have you made with dso's like i would assume you know price is a big thing what if you give one price to someone and then somebody else hears about it i'm sure that kind of jeopardizes you in a way but um uh, what kind of things have you noticed I, i've made all of them all the mistakes I made them multiple times, you know. Uh, the internal workings of one DSO getting this for this price and this for that price has never really been a true issue, um, because I've been honest with that and I've explained to you know, you know, hey Jay, I saw what you're doing for ABC Group down there. How come I don't get that price? I'm like, well, that's when we we sat down with your group X Y Z, you didn't value what they valued. You you want it zirconia made in America in five days or less. Mm -hmm. They don't have they don't schedule their patient. You know so like a, 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 bit, a business is a business can only be good at two things and there's three there's three to choose from. You could be the price leader, you could be the quality leader, 
and you could be the, uh, the um, customer service leader, right? Mm. So let me put it in our world, you know, price, quality, turnaround time is usually what I, you know, factors have to be. That's what most doctors will take customer yep. service and you know, turnaround time. Right? Turnaround time. So you can't be, you could can be good at two. So you could be the fastest, cheapest lab, but they're not going to have quality. You can be the fastest, most quality lab, but they're going to have to freaking pay. You know what I mean? Yeah. They can have, you can, you can say, I want good quality and I don't care about price. Well, then you can't care about time. You, you know what I mean? Because it's going to take a long time to make that full mouth roundhouse. So when you're building your infrastructure and you're building your product, you got to have you have to have these little silos of books of business in your mm-hmm. lab, you know? So we know this group is caring all about turnaround time and price, right? So do we want a bad product going after? No, we don't want anything ever coming back because no one makes money with remakes. Not the, you know, not the doctor, not the office, not the lab, not the patient, right? right? You know, so you, there's, there's a certain standard you can't have, you know? Um, you know, so building that, you build your little silos of your groups, you decide, you know, with the group, what they're going to value, and then you price it out current accordingly. Perfect. Um, does leveraging an existing connection help at all when you're getting into CSOs? Huge. It's huge, absolutely. Um, my my best success story is uh, me and Dave. This was years ago. We were doing the trade the sh- trade show circuit, right? Mm-hmm. In our production. We barely had a denture lab. You know, we were just trying to grow. We you know full service crown and bridge lab. We had the outsourcing capability. <laughs> And we were doing every single trade show that year. And what what was interesting is, by the hand of God, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in Christ. You know, so I believe God does things on purpose. Almost in every every aisle we were showing at at each show, in the same aisle was a DSO looking for doctors, right? So I was a I was a dental lab looking for doctors, and this was a DSO looking. So like. So shows get boring, they get slow, they get fed, you know? Yeah. You know? So like there'll be times that we were just bullshit with them. And then like we would go to Detroit and there they were. We go to San Francisco and there they were. We would go to Miami and there they are, whatever, whatever state city we're on. Mm-hmm. And if we struck up a relationship with these these two guys, right? And then one of them ended up being a really long term relationship for me, where everywhere he went, as he got promotions and got better jobs, he took me with him. You know, and he would introduce me and then he would do the same thing every time he would say, hey, I'll get you to the door. The rest is on you, you know, and that's and that's all you need. Right. That's all you want. So uh, leveraging, you know, that's why originally when we started our conversation about going down your account roster, Mm -hmm. you know, you you know, you you might have a great relationship with a doctor that's, you know, getting towards his exit strategy and and income to his nephew or his son, where who's going to take our thing, but they're selling into a group. So you want to leverage that 30 year relationship in the group with this guy so that as he grows, you grow. No, that's, that's a great point. So, uh, kind of going into like relationships, right. And like service is key, you know, it's not always just pricing. What exactly does service mean to you? Being available. 100%. Yeah. Um, best compliment I ever got from a doctor is Jay Collins comes in person to get his ass kicked. You know, just giving them a, cho- a throat to choke, you know, bad or good. Um, you know, everyone knows, you know, our audience today, my cell phone's on our website. I, you know, it's on my, you know, my LinkedIn. It's, you know, being available, you know, and, but I'm the owner. That's my style. You know, girl that just walked past a woman, that's Allie. She's one of our main second level support people. She sits right next to me. Michelle sits to my right. You know, I answer questions all day for them as they're for our clients, right? Um, they give out their cell phone too, and I've never asked them to. Amazing. I'll, I'll get text messages on the weekend from Allie or Michelle about cases about mm-hmm. doctors. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work on my farm here, and you know, like, yeah. what are you like, you know? And I love it, you know. And I've never asked them to do that, you know. So, um, but that's a culture you got to build, you know, mm-hmm. because that's what true customer service is. Uh, getting the stuff done on time, you know, having yeah. it priced right, having the bill right, all that, that's part of it, but making yourself available at the time they need you. So you would say you're the main point of contact for these DSO accounts? Uh, would you have like a no, staff? No, we break it up, right? Um, yeah. It's, you know, so I, I'll, I'm usually the one that gets, you know, being the, in the term of sales, I'm the best hunter in our organization. You know, I, I like to thrill the hunt after I, you know, after I kill it and drag it back. 
they kind of figure they figure out cutting it up and how we're going to eat it i'm on to the next one you know like whatever that is the next project in production the next dso uh, the next lab acquisition right um that's just my that's my makeup that's my my style you know so that's why i brought david dave's been with me you know almost 12 years you know he's a great farmer he's a great you know account manager and nurturer so you know like so he he has a plan that april and him follow up with to make sure that those people are getting what they need perfect um so when it comes to managing your overflow work right i know you talked a little bit about it you have kind of some uh, you know companies you work with to uh manage that overflow but uh do you tend to lean on them more and are they prepared for it when like peak seasons arise or you know maybe people are sick or something happens machines go down do you have like it's a contingency plan to you know overflow like say a huge amount like say 100 units just at a switch of a a light so um well COVID showed us all this right exactly <laughs> so uh yeah if you don't have a plan b uh you're 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 done um and you certainly and my belief is when you plan c now too right you know so um you know so with our design work you know, we, you know, we're, we just started, you know, this isn't, this isn't a shameless plug for you guys, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we've been with, uh, you know, a group out of India for a long time for our overflow design work. We have uh, four in-house designers. We lost one to, uh, you know, Dandy this year, um, you know, and we couldn't compete with their offer and it was a better, it was a better fit for them, you know what I mean? So, and it's like, okay, well, to grow and trade another designer, can we do that right now? No. You know, so that's, you know, out, you know, outsource a little bit more. But when you outsource, you lose control, which is very hard for us. Then allow people, right? Exactly. You know, so, you know, we want control of everything. So what is the most important thing then? If you're going to, if you're willing to give up the control, is give up, you, you know, the case itself. Is you've mm -hmm. got to have communication. And you've got to have availability, right? So we pick our outsource partners by their availability, by their willingness to help us. You know, not just take the case and make it, but, you know, call us. So um, we've been in China. My family's been manufacturing overseas probably almost 20 years. Uh, you know, okay. my, cousin lived, my cousin lived there for seven years, flown in Mandarin. My uncle went there and trained them on implant technology numerous times. Um, we've been in Vietnam now. This is our second tour in Vietnam. We, uh, uh, you know, for the whole fact of COVID, you know, with, you know, have to have redundancy, right? And, um uh, and these are great partners for us. Uh, we have long-term relationships, but what I found along the way, a lot of labs have a hard time building these relationships overseas. It's not easy, you know, and it's not natural. Yeah. So we, we actually offer a service where we have a lot of lab partners that you help us by using us, that uh, use our, you know, and I'm their main contact point uh, person with my sister, Terry, uh, and we source them work uh, both domestically and internationally. And what that has done is helped us build this small network. We have like about 15, 20 labs total where we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. We're all using the same manufacturers. So it gave mm -hmm. me more more buying power to negotiate better with our, our vendors overseas to get us better UPS rates you know, to work together. Yeah. And also, they have been a resource for us for rush cases and stuff like, hey, but I know your lab's really good at this. You know, can I send this case to you real quick? I, I'm in a jam. I, you know, I, my ceram. I just had my best ceram go back to Albania because his dad got sick. You know, I, and I can't. I don't have time to send this anywhere else. You know, so it, it's building that network. Uh, networking you know, is so. huge. Yeah. So, um, I mean, and it's been a great, it's been a great blessing for us to have that. Um, but I'm honest with my outsource providers. I tell them, mm -hmm. I don't, I, you know, you're a necessary evil for me to build my business. I, I love you guys. I respect you guys, you know, but, um, you know, they, they get a lot of stuff where I only require them to set teeth or just mill and I finish here and they ask, well, why can't I finish them? Like, well, that's not the workflow. You know, we're trying to, you know, I have 20 finishers here that I, you know, that I'm mm -hmm. trying to keep, you know, profitably fit. Amazing. I got a good question from um, one of our audience members. Uh, with inflation exploding, what is the best way to get price increases from the DSOs? Okay, this is this is phenomenal question. Um, you know, uh, they have they are hard up when it comes to they set the price, mm -hmm. right? Um, when they say, okay, you agree on a price. So let's say you agree to do a fifty dollars a crony crown made overseas for them. All right. 
Um, yep. They expect you to hold that for a certain amount of months or possibly, you know, all mine have been two years, right? Um, years? But two years, right? I've been my most. During this most recent stage of where we have, I have had four of my ESOs work with me on price. Because okay. they, are, they are in the current market. You have to understand, like, we, they're, they're people too, right? They're humans too, you know? Um, and what they hate is when you're sneaky, right? Uh, like, so there's there's a couple of got there's a couple of lab guys out there, not you know bigger groups, bigger lab groups, um, servicing DSOs, and they're like, oh yeah, I'll make you a sixty-two dollars a thirty crown in America, which is possible, you know, it's not a lot of money left on it for the lab, but I, I get what it does. But then they'll sneak in their uh, bridge connector charges or <laughs> a, a poor die or something like that that yeah, they don't yeah. speak about. Where That's I am, yeah. where I am about being straightforward and honest has got me so much more clout and and being blue, blue, blunt it's just being honest with them it's like hey i can't afford to do this work with the with inflation you know i'm sorry you know you know elections have consequences yeah. we're dealing with it now we have to deal with it now, right you know this is the result this is the world we live in uh, what's the worst thing they're going to say no okay they say no then you have to restructure and refigure out but you know it sucks you don't want to lose any business but it's not you can't afford to do it uh, you know um you know, without making a profit, you, you know what I mean? Or you yeah, can, great answer. Or you can talk to them about switching to workflows. Like, hey man, you know, we're doing these crowns for you for sixty nine bucks man in America. I either gotta, I either gotta raise you to five, you know, seventy five or whatever it is, or I gotta send them out. You know, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to lose you as a client. What do you want me to do? You know, and you, it's, it's they're pretty reasonable people. You know, because these, all these contracts that they make you sign on pricing, basically say this and this alone. That they can tear it up at any time, you know. So you just make sure you put in there that you can tear it up at any time. You, you, you get what I'm saying? No, I completely understand. That no, that's a great way to put it. Um, we're kind of reaching the top of the hour. We're gonna do a couple more polls out, and then I kind of want to go with our conclusion. You know, kind of our yeah. final thoughts. Um, what would you say is the most important message uh, you'd want to give to our audience? Um, it is extremely difficult, scary times. Mm-hmm. Both, both in our industry and in our culture, in our world, um, you cannot run your business from fear. You cannot run your life from fear. You have to have an abundance mentality. Even if it's only you and three other people, you have to think to yourself: I will grow this. I will move this. I will excel at this. If you do not have that that kind of concept, then you need to think about your exit strategy and find something that you do have that concept. Because if in this world right now, with the way everything is going, if you do not attack it every day like that, you're going to be stuck in the quagmire, and it's only a matter of time before you're going to be out of business. Jay, great answer. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming here and being with us. Uh, no problem, man. Whatever you guys want. And then uh, my cell, 570-336-7724. That's 570-336-7724. Call me, text me, right? Um, uh, you know, don't be surprised if I text you back at three o'clock in the morning when you text me. You know. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. Have a good rest of your yeah. day. God bless, guys. Take care.